And so you oblige us. You be encouraged. Don't let unmet expectations and that sense of what difference is my life and my ministry making uh, discourage you or drive you out of your service to the Lord. Instead, remember that God is working in the quiet seasons of ministry too. Just do the next thing that he tells you to do and remember that God's work doesn't depend completely upon you. And stay faithful to God because as with Elijah, you have no idea what he has planned for you on the other side of this season of discouragement in your life and in your ministry. I just told Sandy after that session, um, I wasn't aware of anything that uh, is going on in my life that is in that vein, but it's one of those studies where you just want to go take a walk for an hour and let it just search every single area of your life. And so that'll have to wait for another time, but it'll definitely happen. But a great theme uh, for this conference. I don't know how it came about, certainly through prayer and, um, and to be able to encounter uh, these truths that apply to us uh, as they do uh, from these various characters in Scripture. When uh, Joe called me uh, about and extended an invitation um, to teach, and thank you, Joe, for that, um, it, my mind immediately uh, and heart went to one particular place, and, and then it just stayed there. And so I hope it'll be a blessing to you today. Let's stand for a moment, and we'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings 19. Boy, this is really nice. I said, hi. Verse 11. And, the, and then he, that is the Lord, said to Elijah, Get out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a Great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. And then you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shephat, uh, of uh, Abel uh, Maola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. And yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this conference to be able to come together and to be refreshed and to come and receive as is all, certainly on all of our hearts to have uh, the encounter with you that you know that we need. And you've certainly done that and we know you'll continue to do it and we pray that you would use this session to bring uh, the wisdom and the direction and the perspectives that is needed in some of our lives here today through the prophet Elisha, Elijah. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. 
Elijah was, of course, one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. He was a man filled with the Holy Spirit and this noble desire that he would be able to turn the nation of Israel uh, from its idolatry and back to the worship of the true and the living God. It's good to be in Elijah and to have a great zeal for the things of God, but Elijah's do have a weakness that we need to be careful of in terms of our own lives, and I want to talk about that this morning as we uh, examine the greatest crisis of his life and of his ministry. The circumstances surrounding his ministry are as follows. He served the Lord during the reign of King Ahab, and who under the influence of his wife Jezebel was the most m uh, wicked of all of the kings that ever reigned in the northern kingdom of Israel, and all uh, the only uh, all of the kings that reigned in the northern kingdom of Israel were wicked. In other words, Ahab and Jezebel in that reign, he was wicked in a context of wickedness. Now that's a remarkable uh, thing to be said about a person. Elijah bursts on the scene really out of nowhere in chapter 17. The encapsulation, I think, of uh, Elijah's life is found uh, in the first words that he spoke to King uh, Ahab in chapter 17, verse 1, when he declared, the Lord God of Israel lives. And when a person really believes that, uh, not just on Easter, but all of the time, that's going to produce a certain quality of life. That's going to produce a certain kind of person. And it's going to produce a bold life. And Elijah lived and he spoke like his God was alive. And when he first came on the scene, he prophesied of a drought that would extend years uh, into the future uh, upon the land because of its wickedness. And then after this great dramatic beginning to his uh, public ministry, the Lord uh, takes him and uh, brings him back into obscurity. And God directed him to the brook Cherith by the Jordan River. And there Elijah, as you might remember, was fed day by day, morning and evening, by uh, ravens. Imagine that. It's one thing for it to be on the pages of Scripture. But imagine having that as a part of your life experience with God and your ministry experience with God, that the ravens came and they fed you uh, morning and night. And then as the uh, drought lingered day by day, he watched that brook Cherith, uh, the very source of his sustenance in that drought, begin to dry up before his eyes. And then at the very last moment, uh, he was sent by God to Zarephath to be sustained by a Gentile woman, which would have been very humbling for a Jewish prophet. And all of this was God was, prepared, was doing more than just supplying uh, Elijah with his physical needs during this uh, hard season in the history uh, of Israel, but God was developing his faith, and God was preparing Elijah's faith for a particular event on Mount Carmel. And for three and a half years, he developed, God developed his faith for Mount Carmel, and God always works in our lives today, uh, not just with today in mind, though I tend to think of it that way, but also with his future plans for our lives in mind. He knows what's coming in life, and he's always faithful to prepare us uh, for it. And it's always important, at least for me, to be reminded of the fact that as hard as the preparation can be, and the preparations can be very hard, there is something harder in life than the preparation, and that is to end up in that situation in the future unprepared, to not have our faith and our character prepared for uh, what God knows is coming our way, and God will never do that uh, in, in our lives. His mountaintop experience of Mount Car uh, Carmel was amazing, of course. He calls together and kind of a God showdown there. 
uh, the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asherah, gathers all of the people of Israel together at that site. And we're told in 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah came to all of the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, uh, then follow him. And then Elijah prophesied and proclaimed. And chapter 18, verse 23, therefore, uh, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it, under it. and you shall, then you shall call uh, on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And so all of the people said, it is well spoken. And so Elijah turns the stage over uh, to the prophets of Baal. And, uh, and so from morning to noon, they begin to cry out to their uh, God uh, for Baal to answer by fire. When Elijah proposes this particular kind of God showdown, uh, the uh, the prophets of Baal had to be whispering to one another that Elijah would be so silly as to uh, propose something like he did. Uh, Baal was the God that was supposedly in control of the weather. He was in control of lightning. And here is Elijah proposed something that is, plays right to the strengths of Baal. And of course we know that it was no accident at all on Elijah's Part. And so from morning until noon, they cry out and uh, no answer. Then from noon to the evening sacrifice, they cry out, cutting themselves with knives, no answer. And then Elijah uh, comes on the scene. He takes center stage now and he calls for 12 stones to be put together. He puts them in place. And then he piles the wood upon that. He piles the pieces of his offering, uh, that bull up, uh, upon that. And then he calls for uh, four water pots filled with water to be brought, poured on the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the earth. And he, call, and he has that done three times there on that scene until the trench around it is is full of water, and, I, and I, Elijah didn't want anyone thinking that what was about to happen, and he knew what was about to happen, wasn't a coincidence, or nobody walking away talking about uh, spontaneous combustion or something like that. And so all of these actions that Elijah uh, performs there, uh, they are the actions of someone who is absolutely confident that his God is alive, and he calls the people uh, near to him, and then he prayed, and of course the Lord sent fire from heaven that lapped up the sacrifice, the wood, even the stones, all of the water, and even uh, the dust. And when the people saw it, we're told that they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And then Elijah proceeded to execute the prophets of uh, but all, all of it in accordance with the law of Moses uh, because of uh, their, uh, who were responsible for the slaughter of all of the prophets of uh, Jehovah. And then, of course, we know concerning Elijah that he lived happily ever after, going from mountaintop experience to mountaintop experience, <laughs> victory to victory, never to have a doubt of faith uh, for the remainder of, uh, of his life and ministry. And and you stop and you look at him right here at this point in his ministry, and you would think that a man who had that as a part of his history, uh, that a man who had been used by God in this way, uh, he may have many crises in his life, but that he will never have a crisis of faith. And yet that's exactly the crisis uh, that Elijah ends up having. Uh, Jezebel at the beginning of chapter 19 threatens him, I'm going to kill you for what you've done and uh, essentially uh, declaring Elijah to be a dead man in Israel. And then Elijah proceeded to run for his life 
He runs to Beersheba and uh, all the way down in the wilderness of the southern part of, uh, of Israel, out in the desert. He moves, uh, runs as far away from the northern kingdom as he can and still remain in the land of, of Israel. And when I read about the actions of Elijah here on this scene, I think to myself, who is this imposter? Uh, where did they take my Elijah? Uh, where have you hidden him and bring him back to me? What have you done to my hero here? And uh, what happened to the man of faith? And one great threat from a powerful woman made him forget three years of God's faithfulness to him in the drought, made him even forget the great victory on, uh, on Mount uh, Carmel. And now Elijah is in the middle of a huge personal crisis in his ministry and in his walk with the Lord. He's very discouraged, to say the least, in his ministry. So much so that he desired to die. And he prayed for death. He prayed for God to kill him. Now, we as pastors, we may resign on a regular basis in our minds, but on Sunday nights, I don't know how many of you cry out to God to kill you. Um, <laughs> this is new territory for most of us. Some of you are thinking, well, I hadn't thought about the potential of that. I mean, <laughs> some Sundays can be that bad. And he's just asking God, Lord, would you put me out of my misery? And I'll tell you, I am almost as thankful for the prayers that the Lord has ignored that I have prayed in the course of my life as the ones that he has uh, answered. And then Elijah, <clears throat> of course, the Lord refused to uh, kill him and, and, uh, and came to him and asked him, uh, twice, once in verse 9 and again in verse 13, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah's response is the same, exactly the same both times. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. The translation of that is, Lord, I've done what is right in your eyes. I've done it uh, with all of my heart. I've done it with zeal, with a zeal for you and a zeal for your name. I've done it in the midst of the worst ap apostasy imaginable among your people. I alone am left, and I'm as good as dead. And Lord, it looks like we're losing and the wicked are winning. And is this any way to run a kingdom? If it should be the other way around. And Elijah's very discouraged, and I'm convinced that even the greatest of God's servants will find themselves exactly in this place at uh, one time or another. Even the strongest, the boldest, the most fearless, the, uh, the uh, most mightily used by God, and I think maybe even especially the strongest and the boldest and the most fearless. And when I look at this chapter in Elijah's life, I wonder what is it that could take such a bold, powerful, fearless prophet of God and cause him to not only quit his ministry, but wish to die. And I noticed Two causes, and both of them, I think, are instructive for any servant of the Lord. And cause number one is really the implication of chapter 19, verse 4. Elijah was filled with this sense that what I am doing for God doesn't seem to be making any difference at all. And it is one of the most powerful weapons that Satan uses to discourage uh, uh, God's servants in an effort to get them to quit their Christian service. And so perhaps like Elijah, you've served the Lord for years, and you look around at the results and you ask yourself, what difference am I making? What difference is my life making? 
I don't see that my life is making any difference at all. Wickedness continues as it always has. In fact, during the entire term of my ministry, it's only grown. And to be completely open about it, I don't think it would make any difference at all in the grand scheme of things if I quit or if I was dead. And if you feel that way today, you're not the first one. The second cause of his discouragement was what we might call unmet expectations, and we see this uh, implied in verses 10 and 14. Things haven't turned out the way that he thought they uh, would. God hasn't done things the way that he thought God would do them. And that is another very powerful uh, discouragement in our service to the Lord. And I think it's very important to notice that it isn't some physical difficulty or physical hardship or some loss of comfort that discourages an Elijah. He never complained about being fed by ravens or drought or drying streams or being fed by a Gentile widow woman that never discourages an Elijah. But Elijah's do have a weakness. And Elijah was discouraged because Mount Carmel didn't translate into what he thought it would. It didn't have the spiritual impact in the nation that he thought it would. It didn't bring the great revival that he thought it would. It didn't bring the change uh, that he thought it would. And there he is, he's given it his best shot. The nation is still in apostasy. Uh, evil is still seems to be winning, and Ahab and Jezebel are still ruling. God didn't destroy them when he had the perfect chance to do so. And worst of all, instead of Mount Carmel becoming a place where everything got turned around and where the momentum in Israel turned toward righteousness, God allowed, think of it in his mind, God allowed Jezebel to threaten Elijah with his life. And at that point in Elijah's ministry, the great problem that he is dealing with has nothing to do with Ahab and Jezebel supremely. His problem is with God. And as a result, Elijah's whole world was spinning. And Elijah wasn't doubting the power of God. What he was doubting was the ways of God in his life, the wisdom of God in his life. And some people have a crisis of faith because they lack faith. Elijah had a crisis of faith precisely because he had faith. And Elijah was a man who knew God's power. He had experienced it. He knew what God was able to do experientially. His life had been three and a half years of one miracle after another. His entire life was a testimony to the power and the ability of God. And so Elijah's problem is not a crisis of faith in the sense that he at all doubted the ability uh, of, of the Lord. His struggle was with what he knew God could do instantly what God could do effortlessly, and yet he wasn't doing. And maybe that's you today. Your Christian walk and ministry has included the miraculous of God. In your own way, you've been fed by ravens, and you've watched streams dry up and learned to wait for God's direction in the midst of all of it. You've had your Mount Carmel's where God is before the entire world shown himself strong on your behalf. And you're not a novice in your service to God. And all of the stories that you could tell about the miraculous that God has done uh, in your life. And yet now, here you are today in a place where things aren't quite working out the way that you thought they would. And the biggest struggle that you have is not with what God can or cannot do, but rather with what you know he could do in a second, and yet he isn't. And that can be one of the hardest and the most discouraging trials we will go through. 
and you're under the, uh, ready to quit under the weight of it. And you understand exactly those words of Elijah in verse 4, it is enough, now take my life, for I am no better than my father's. I'm a failure as much as they were in turning uh, back the kingdom of darkness and advancing the kingdom. What difference am I making, Lord? And it doesn't seem as if you're doing anything either. And his prayer is, God, if you're going to give me this much zeal for you, if you're going to fill my life with this much zeal uh, for your ways and then do nothing with it, then take me out. This is not what I expected. Now, God doesn't leave Elijah or us there. The lesson isn't that Elijah, Elijah got bummed and you're bummed and you're in good company, historically. <laughs> I mean, misery loves company, so it's some help. But it's not the help that God has for us in the passage. And we want to close by noticing three things that God does in order to lift Elijah out of his discouragement. And they're found in the passage that we read to open uh, the, the uh, time. In verses 11 through 14, first of all, the Lord revealed more about himself and his ways uh, to Elijah. And he had Elijah stand on the mountain, Mount Horeb, uh, before the Lord. And as he stands there, a great wind passes by, and God wasn't in the wind. The wind is followed by an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And the earthquake was followed by a fire, but God wasn't in the fire. And finally, a still, small voice, and God was in that still, small voice. And what the Lord was teaching Elijah, and all Elijah's sense, is that not all of life and ministry is going to be Mount Carmel's, and that he is not any less God, and he is, that he is not working any less powerfully, not only in our lives, but through our lives when things are quiet and when things are still. God is still in control when things are quiet and still, and that he's present and powerful in the still, quiet times too. And God was teaching Elijah not to judge the importance of his ministry to the Lord by whether it is wind and fire and earthquake, but that still small voice ministries are important works of the Holy Spirit as well. And Elijah's have to learn that, and it's not easy for them. Elijah's are doers. They're people of action. And with Elijah's, in terms of naturally speaking, it always has to be wind and earthquake and fire or else they feel that God's cause is lost. And God lets Elijah know that that isn't true. The second thing that the Lord does with Elijah to lift him out of his discouragement is in verses 15 through 17. And you notice that the Lord simply told Elijah what to do next. And the Lord really cracks me up here because he completely ignores uh, Elijah's uh, resignations. <laughs> Elijah has quit twice, and God acts as if he never heard it. I mean, you can almost hear Elijah thinking to himself, in case nobody's noticing, somebody's trying to quit here. And God says, I can't hear you. And God doesn't even give him the option to quit. Doesn't even mention it. It's like it didn't happen. And he tells him, you go and you anoint Haziel and then Jehu and Elisha. In other words, Elisha, don't, Elijah, don't be so uh, overwhelmed by the size and the power of evil in the world or even among my people. You simply take your place in my plan, and you leave the big picture to me. And Elijah's lament is, oh, what difference will my life and my service make? My life hasn't made any difference. And God's answer to Elijah and to us is, that's not your 
problem. That's not your problem. Our responsibility is just simply to obey and take our place in where he's called us to serve him and do what he tells us to do, and he'll take care of the rest. And Elijah was carrying, Elijah was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, certainly the weight of the whole nation on his shoulders, and Elijah's tend to do that. And the Lord reminded Elijah that that wasn't his job, that that's God's job. And Elijah's job was just simply to do what God told him to do next. And it's so simple. And Elijah's need it to be made simple. And leave the big picture to God and simply do the next thing that he tells us to do. We can't change the whole world, but we can do that. And then the third thing is that the Lord then informed Elijah that God's plan didn't depend upon him. Elijah thought it all depended upon him. Thought he's the last one and everything depends upon him and, and, uh, and all Elijahs think that. And he suffered from this exaggerated sense of his own importance. And Elijahs do that. And sooner or later, later, every Elijah will run out of his own strength and his own energy and his own resources. And then in that exhaustion, the Elijah will reveal what has driven him, at least in part, in this sense that everything depends upon him or uh, that it is uh, all depends upon him or on I alone. Again, in verses 10 and 14, it all depends upon me. It's all going to collapse without me. And then the Lord revealed to Eli Elijah that he had 7,000 times the resources that Elijah thought he did. God's purposes and his plans in this world are never dependent upon anything as weak and tenuous as you and I, certainly not supremely at all. And so God's work isn't in any trouble. We can all just take a deep breath, and uh, whether it is his work in the whole world or his work in the church that he's called us to pastor and to serve uh, in. And then uh, the... Uh, to hear that for an Elijah is humbling, but it's absolutely freeing. Now, Elijah thinks his life is over. At least he wants it to be over. <laughs> and, uh, and he thinks his ministry is over. At least he wants it to be over. But he could not, in his wildest dreams, have understood or believed at that time the future that God had planned for him on the other side of this crisis of faith that he found himself in, this bout of with discouragement that he found himself in, a future fiery chariot ride up into heaven, a future appointment with Jesus himself and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, an amazing place in the Lord's yet future plan for ushering in his kingdom is one of the two witnesses in Jerusalem during the great tribulation. And so you Elijahs, you be encouraged. Don't let unmet expectations and that sense of what difference is my life and my ministry making uh, discourage you or drive you out of your service to the Lord. Instead, remember that God is working in the quiet seasons of ministry too. Just do the next thing that he tells you to do and remember that God's work doesn't depend completely upon you. And stay faithful to God because as with Elijah, you have no idea what he has planned for you on the other side of this season of discouragement in your life and in your ministry. Whatever it is, it will be, as Paul described the will of God in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that it is good and it is acceptable 
and it is perfect, and it is in front of us. A will that is good for us, acceptable to God, and absolutely perfect for us in the eyes of God. Let's pray together now. Father, we pray that you use this time through this wonderful servant of yours. We thank you for revealing him as you have in order that his life might be the encouragement to us today that it is. And I pray for us and we pray for one another that you'd use this time to protect your calling upon the lives of pastors and others in this room today for what it is that they find themselves in the middle of today and the discouragement of those circumstances and then for all of us, Lord, to use it as a protection against those same things in the future of each of our services to you. And we pray and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Let him just drench you like you're standing under Niagara Falls of liquid love and let the Holy Ghost baptize you afresh. That all the trials and the tribulations, all of it can just go away. And you're not just at another conference. You're in the presence of God Almighty. And He's with us right now. He's called us from all around the world to be here. Not to be pencil and paper people, but to be broken people that He can take back and fill in front of His congregations.